Hi folks, welcome to BIS 3 Lecture 12. Today finally is a day. We're almost at the finish line. Today we'll actually make ATP. So for this lecture, we'll focus on continuing to discuss the process of our electron transport chain, our ETC. And specifically, we want to emphasize today the concept of the proton motive force and the ATP synthase as the enzyme that actually catalyzes the production of ATP. So again, I have broken it up into two videos. In this one here, I will mostly focus on continuing our use of bioenergetics to understand the ETC processes, as well as the proton motive force. So these are our learning goals then. We want to continue and sort of complete our understanding of the composition of the complex of enzymes of the ETC and understand why they're so important for transferring electrons and protons. And then specifically today, we want to understand this concept of the protein motive force and how we can apply it to ATP synthesis. And so to bring everybody back up to speed right from our last lecture, just to briefly go over the key points of our ETC complexes, right, it's highlighted here again, is our entire ETC here, the different complexes one to four and the ATP synthase on the very right, they're membrane bound complexes sitting and are bound to the inner membrane of the mitochondria when we look at eukaryotic systems. Right, so on the bottom side here, we have our inner, inner membrane matrix. Then we have the intermembrane space that is sitting between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. And so the ETC is membrane integrated into the inner membrane of the mitochondria here. Okay. What we're doing is, right, we're using our reduced electron carriers, NADH and FADH2. The electrons from those will be transferred through the individual complexes so the electrons will be taken up by the complexes and transferred over running through the entire electron transfer chain. So specifically here complex one will take electrons from NADH, will oxidize NADH in the process. Those electrons will be transferred to CoQ here, is identified here as Q. Then complex two will also take electrons in this case from FADH2, we'll transfer them from CoQ. We had also talked about the additional dehydrogenases that are not part of the four key complexes, but are donating reduced electron carriers to the ETC, specifically our glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle and the dehydrogenase that is catalyzing this. Again, bringing in electrons from FADH2 to CoQ and likewise so, uh, fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase coming from um, better oxidation of fatty acids, also bringing in electrons from FADH2. Everything now culminating in CoQ here, and then CoQ will transfer all of these electrons to complex three. And because of this function of CoQ, right, sort of going to all these different complexes, and grabbing all the electrons, then transferring them over to complex three. It is a key branching point of the ETC. Everything now culminating in complex three. So all the electrons from CoQ will end up there. Complex three will transfer them over to a mobile protein, a heme containing cytochrome, cytochrome C, that will hand over the electrons to our final complex, complex four, and this complex now will transfer the electrons as a final redox reaction to our terminal acceptor oxygen. We're generating water. We're finalizing the electron transfer all the way. In the same time, we're using now the energy that is being released from these complexes to pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. And specifically here we see we're pumping four protons from the matrix through complex one. No protons are being pumped from complex two, and we'll see when we talk about bioenergetics why that is. Again, complex three, also pumping four protons. In this particular case, it's slightly different. There are two that are coming directly from the matrix and two that are actually coming from CoQ, and they originated usually from NADH2. So CoQ also can transfer these hydrogens. It's not essential to know, especially not for exams, but just to provide a complete picture here. 
And then our last complex, complex four is pumping two protons from the matrix, not four, because two are actually needed right, for the reduction of oxygen and the conversion to water. And so in total, you see we're actually pumping in this process, if we come all the way from NADH, from complex one, we're pumping 10 protons. If we're coming from, for example, FADH, right, the complex one does not take FADH, all the other complexes do, especially they're coming in from complex two and the other dehydrogenases. So there we're actually pumping only six protons because we're bypassing complex one. So it's a different amount of protons that are being pumped and that's actually really important for ATP production. So now that we know and have reminded ourselves, at least in the big picture, how the ETC works, let's look at some of the bioenergetics and how we can actually bring about this proton gradient and ATP synthesis. So last lecture already, I had talked about the standard reduction potential, the SRP and how it can be used for calculating the bioenergetics of electron transfer. I then had used our overall reaction here of NADH running the electrons through the entire ETC all the way to our terminal acceptor oxygen. And we had calculated right, that this has a standard reduction potential of 1.136. We had talked about how this works and how we can correlate this now with Gibbs free energy with our delta G0 prime with this formula here. Again, you don't have to remember that. I will provide you with it if we need to apply it. And so the overall outcome was that we had a Gibbs free energy of about minus 220 kilojoule per mole of NADH oxidized so of this electron transfer through the ETC starting with NADH. And so then I said homework, right? Let's have a look at the individual complexes and what the bioenergetics for the individual complexes look like. Right? This reaction up here involves all four complexes. So for those of you who already have done this, you can just follow along and see if we came to the same conclusion. Otherwise, I would encourage you to do these exercises. And I will just highlight it now for the first complex here. Right? What our first complex is doing, again, it's taking NADH and it's taking CoQ. NADH is oxidized, the electrons are transferred to CoQ, which is being reduced to CoQH2. Again, we can break this down into the half cells here, which is the oxidation of NADH to NAD+, releasing two electrons, two hydrogens, two protons, and the reduction of CoQ, two electrons, two protons, to the reduced CoQ. We had said, right, people have actually measured and calculated all the delta E0 primes, all the standard reduction potentials for these half cells. So we want to bring back our table here. Again, if you're doing these calculations, already have done so, make sure you always look at the values here in the direction of reduction. So you actually have to turn them around if you're looking at an oxidation reaction. And this is particularly the case here, right, for NAD. We have it here in the reduction direction. We are doing the oxidation here. So our standard reduction potential of minus 0.32 has to be turned around is actually plus because we're looking in the direction of oxidation. And then we can look at the same for CoQ here. In this older table, it's listed as UQ, but it's the same thing. Here we're doing the reduction, so we're already okay for the value. And this is 0 0.06. We had said, right, these values are additive, much like our delta G0 prime, so we can do this. And what we get from this is right here, the individual values, if we add them, we have a standard reduction potential of 0 0.08 for the two half cells. Now, if we bring this into calculating delta G0 prime, right, with our formula here and calculate this, we're getting to a Gibbs-free energy under standard conditions of around minus 70 kilojoule per mole. Okay. So spontaneous, hexagonic left to right, this looks pretty good still, right? It's not as hexagonic as our overall reaction, but actually complex one, as you can see, provides a huge chunk of the bioenergy that we are releasing here. So for the other complexes, I just show the outcomes here. And what you see is actually the energy released is quite different. Complex two, for example, here is um, much less so. It's almost zero. It's only almost minus 
um, six kilojoule per mole. The other ones again are larger. All are negative though. So what we can see here is right a positive standard reduction potential equals a negative Gibbs free energy. Right? And so this energy that we release now that we can use to transfer protons against the gradient. Okay. So again, if you haven't done these exercises at home, I would strongly encourage you to do so to understand how these half reactions and these reduction oxidations help us to understand the energy that is being released from these reactions. And so now, right, we can use this, right? I just told you, right, all these three complexes, complex one, three, and four are pumping protons. If you come from NADH, they're pumping 10. And so per NADH, we have 10 protons. And what actually has been measured is that per ATB produced, we need about four protons being pumped or the energy that is stored in these four protons. So if you make the quick calculation, you're actually getting out two and a half ATP per NADH. Because we're bypassing complex one that is pumping four protons, if we are coming in with FADH2, we only have six here. So by the same calculation, we're making one ATP less, one and a half. So at long last, I finally provide you with some evidence of why we actually came up with these values in the scientific community on how much ATP is produced through uh, running these two electron carriers through the ETC. So keep those values in mind as we are moving on. Here we go. So the next question is that we know now how much of energy has been released. That's great. We had seen that it is hexagonic, but how much work do these complexes actually have to do to pump protons? Are we making enough in essence? And so again, proton movement actually can be measured. And there are a couple of units that we need to look at here. So we need to look at the relative pH, so the, the gradient of pH of moving protons. And so this has been measured as about 0.75 to one units across a mitochondrial inner membrane or IM. Okay. Another value is the charge differential that we have to look at that also has been measured and is the delta phi here at 0.15 volt. Again, you don't have to remember these values but we will use them now to understand how much energy we actually need. And so using these values, some smart people have come up with a way to actually mathematically calculate the cellular free Gibbs free energy now, not actually standard conditions. And so what you can do is you can use a Getz constant in temperature, you bring in your delta pH and a number of other factors here, which is your charge, this your Faraday constant and your delta phi. Again, you don't have to remember exactly how it works. I will not actually ask you to apply it. What is really key here is that the measurement of this proton gradient under the conditions measured under these circumstances is 19 kilojoule per mole. So that looks pretty good that we can do this, right? We had a lot higher numbers in the negative for the release of electrons, but this is now the bar we have to reach to pump protons. So let's look at a membrane and see if, how this actually will work and correlate it to ATP synthesis too. So now just very simplified, your mitochondrial membranes, right? You have your outer membrane here, OM, your inner membrane, IM, and then the inner membrane space here. And you want to push your protons here into the inner membrane space, right? And so by this formula up here, we just had defined that we need 19 kilojoule per mole of protons moved across a membrane. Okay. This also means, right, that we're releasing an equivalent of 19 kilojoule per mole of protons flowing spontaneously back across a membrane that can be used by the ATP synthase later. But please keep in mind that right, this is illustrated as a static value, right, using the, the values for this condition. Obviously, the energy demand increases as the gradient increases. Right? So basically you can imagine this as pumping up your bike tire, right? The more you pump in, the harder it gets to pump in even more, same idea. But then when you release it, you also release more air. The same is true here for 
the energy needed to get protons across into the inner membrane space and for the spontaneous flux of the protons back. And that can be used by the ATP synthase, this energy of the proton spontaneously flowing back. And this is why the ETC and the ATP synthase are inherently coupled to each other, right? Without building this proton gradient, the ATP synthase doesn't have the energy that it needs to make ATP. If the ATP synthase doesn't work, you're not releasing this energy and you so would continue building up the gradient here, eventually making it too hard for electrons to flow and to pump protons across the membrane. So let's look at our complexes, right? How does this work? So here again, our complexes and the Gibbs free energies that we just had calculated. Right? You can see all of complex one, three and four have negative Gibbs free energies under standard conditions that are higher than the 19 indicated here. So those should be able to pump protons and so they do. But our complex two, right, we had seen does not pump protons because actually the energy release is less than 19. So there's actually simply not enough energy release in this complex to pump protons. Okay. So you can look at sort of the delta G0 prime of the transfer in the complexes. You can add it to the Gibbs free energy of the pumping of protons. And so for as long as this is a negative value, the ETC will run. Okay. The moment this equals zero, so the energy of the transfer and the energy of the pumping is equal, the ETC will stop. And so this is sort of the mathematical relationship of why ETC and the ATP synthase are inherently coupled to each other. So just to highlight this again, right here in the image, we have our complex one, three and four, they are pumping protons because of the energy release that I just showed you on our complex two here does not so because there's simply not enough energy that is released as part of its electron transfer um, reactions. The guy who actually came up with this idea of this proton gradient being used was Peter Mitchell. For this idea, he actually eventually got the Nobel Prize. And that was for his understanding of using biological energy transfer through what they called the chemosmotic theory. So he came up with the idea that we could use a gradient of ions and the release from that spontaneous flow of the gradient back as a means of energy to drive enzymatic reactions. Okay. This was very controversial at the time because most people were just in the process of understanding glycolysis. So everyone was essentially looking for this holy grail of the high energy compounds a compound that upon its hydrolysis then would release enough energy to drive the ATP synthase, but nobody could find it. And so Peter Mitchell came up with the chemosmotic theory and he received a lot of negative feedback and criticism for doing so because the paradigm at this time really was it had to be a high energy compound. But eventually it turned out he was right. And so he was awarded with a Nobel Prize for this work. There are actually options now that the ATP synthase and ETC can be uncoupled, right? I just told you they're inherently coupled to each other. It cannot work any other way. But we are doing biochemistry here, so there are always exceptions. And one of those actually is the um, uncoupling protein or the UCP. That's what we call a biological uncoupler. It's a protein. And so I just show it here for your illustration what it actually looks like. It's essentially a protein pore that sits in the membrane in proximity to the ATP synthase in the ETC. And so what it actually does is that it takes some of the protons that have been built up here as part of the ETC in the gradient, and they will just spontaneously flow back through this protein pore, and will actually then not be able to be used by the ATP synthase. Right? This sounds very counterintuitive. Right? You want this energy of protons flowing through the ATP synthase to make ATP. Why would you do this here? Right? To just have them run through a pore. And what actually is happening here is that one of the byproducts of running the gradient without coupling it to a chemical reaction, that the energy that is now released 
by protons flowing back across the gradient is released as heat. And that heat can be useful. Right? And so here are a few examples. Right? The UCB, this uncoupler protein, is actually very abundant in brown adipose. Okay? And this you find particularly in babies, in the neck of babies when they're just freshly born. You have what you call brown adipose. It is brown because it is extremely rich in mitochondria and it contains this uncoupling protein. What it actually does is that you're now using this system and the breakdown of the fat in the baby's adipose to generate heat. Right? You were just in the womb, you're just born, it's much colder outside. So to maintain a baby's body heat, you're actually using this uncoupling protein. Right? It's a pretty smart system. And then as you're actually growing older, you will produce less and less of this protein. And as an adult, you basically don't produce it at all. Also, hibernating animals actually use it. So they are, right, they're fattening up in the fall before they go to sleep, before they hibernate. And so they also are having higher amounts of this uncoupling protein, and they use it to generate body heat while they're hibernating. So another really cool system on how you can use this gradient for also other really important processes outside of producing ATP. An example out of the plant world actually is skunk cabbage. If any of you have been sort of as the Northwest Pacific areas, um, up, up north in Canada, for example, you have this plant called skunk cabbage. And that actually is also producing this uncoupling protein in the winter. And what it does is actually is generating enough heat in its leaf and flowers to melt the snow. And it allows this plant to be one of the first ones to already bloom in the winter. And so having a key advantage to attract pollinators while nobody else is blooming. And so this plant is actually attracting flies, which you can imagine based on its name. It's very stinky. It actually smells like a skunk. But it's really an, a fascinating system that this plant is using this uncoupling protein to generate heat. Another example, this one is an example for a non-biological uncoupler. So you want to remember the difference between the two. A non-biological uncoupler now is essentially a metabolite, um, a, a chemical usually. And so the most prominent example is one that we don't produce. Um, it's 2,4-dinitrophenyl or 2,4-DNP was actually used as a pesticide. Um, some decades back now. So what this metabolite does is that in the inner intermembrane space here, you could this molecule can exist in a um, oxidized form or in a reduced form. And mostly here it will act in its um, oxidized form. And then you have the surplus um, electrons here says, at this oxygen function. They can take up some of the protons that are now build up through pumping protons across the membrane. It's getting reduced. And because of its chemical properties, DNP can actually freely diffuse across this membrane. And so now in the matrix where we have a much lower concentration of protons, this very happily gives away its proton again. And so we will actually uncouple this system now by um, basically having it grab a proton here, freely diffuse across the membrane and releasing it again, the molecule then in its oxidized form can go back and so forth and so forth, grabbing one proton on the other. The other. Okay. This can actually be really problematic, right? Because back in the early 90s, we actually were selling 2,4-DNP um, as a weight loss medication. It was actually banned in 1938, but initially it was used to lose weight. Right? So the idea here being that you could use it, you could take it, and then because you're uncoupling your ATP synthase from the ETC, you are much less efficient in making ATP. So you have to break down more of your fuel resources, more of your sugar and your fats, to bring about the production of the same level of ATP that you need, and so therefore you lose weight. But you can easily imagine, right, what happens if you overdose on this, right? If you're taking too much, right, the uncoupling will increase the more of a dose you have of this compound. If you take too much, you're not making any ATP at all anymore, and this will be fatal. And this actually has happened 
from a few years ago here, there's actually an example of a young student in the UK who bought these drugs. They're actually still available. I've seen them on Amazon and elsewhere and has taken too much of it and actually died because of uncoupling of the ETC and ATP. So she couldn't make any ATP mirror. This is fatal. So it's sort of a life lesson here, right? BIS 103 can provide really important information. So use your biochemistry knowledge and avoid those kind of drugs for weight loss. There are other ways to lose weight. So really pay attention to what you're taking there. This is part one of our lecture 12 now. So we wanted to mostly look at understanding the bioenergetics on how we are coupling the transfer of electrons to the pumping of protons, how we can use this proton motive force that we've generated to drive ATP production. And so this will be now the focus of the second video where we really want to look at the mechanism of this enzyme that makes ATP the ATP synthase.